We're ready. You ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Uh, Representative and Leader Virgin and I uh, felt like there were some things that needed to be said and clarified after the last couple of weeks. So we're going to start, uh, take, uh, make a couple of statements, and then answer questions. Shall I start? Mm -hmm. All right. So um, last week on Thursday, the governor announced that we had a budget. And there have been a lot of questions about uh, transparency since that time. But I will tell you there was a comment made on Thursday during that press conference that um, every member of the legislator, legislature had been consulted and involved in the formulation of the budget. That's not exactly accurate. Um, let me tell you how it happened on the Senate side. Uh, 11 o'clock on that Thursday, 11 in the morning, I had requested that the Appropriations Chair and Vice Chair come visit with our caucus and give us an update and information on the budget itself. Uh, they did come. Uh, we appreciated that. They had a lot of really good information. We had a monitor up on the wall, and we saw a lot of spreadsheets. We were told that uh, we would not be able to have the spreadsheets that morning because the numbers were still fluid. That was the very first time we had seen any actual numbers regarding the budget. At 2.30 that afternoon, just a few hours later, the governor announced that he was having a press conference, and at 3.30, as most of you all know, the governor announced that they had a budget. My concern is that, and the concern of my caucus, is that we hear a lot about open and transparent government up at the Capitol, and that can't just be talking words. They can't, they can't just be words that, that don't mean anything to anyone. Um, we feel like that open and transparent means not only is your legislature entitled to see the numbers and be part of the budgetary process, but more importantly, the public is entitled to that. We are talking about a billion dollar budget that we see four hours before it's announced that the state has a budget. We are only one of four states that waits this long to release a budget, not only to the legislature, but to the public. Nevada, uh, New Jersey and Arizona are the only three states left in the country that have not released a budget. We were fourth. So if we're going to talk about open and transparent, we need to mean what we say. We need open and transparent means en enough time for lawmakers to be able to see the bills and analyze the bills. It means enough time for the public and our constituents to see the bill and analyze those bills. You don't ask somebody to buy a home and sign a mortgage without reading it first. You don't ask somebody to make a major purchase of a vehicle and tell them, you know, we'll explain to you how you're going to pay for it later. Major decisions regarding people's budgets should be treated the same way, and we should treat the same way as we do a budget for the entire state. Every one of us in here represents people in this state. We can't even talk to them about the budget because we didn't know what the numbers were going to be. Now, it's my caucus's intent next year to run bills. And the bills we're going to run are bills that are going to specifically make this budgetary process more open and transparent. I have been up here for nine years. I've seen nine budgets, and every single one of them has been handled this way. Now, let me be clear about one thing. I'm not blaming the, the appropriations chair or the vice chair. When we asked questions, they gave us answers. I'm blaming the process itself. The process has to change. Representative Virgin. Thank you, Leader Floyd, and, and thank you all for being here today. I want to talk about not only the process, but also what the, what the product is when you have a process like this. Since before this legislative session began, House Democrats have called for more transparency, openness, and public input to the one constitutional duty that we have as a state legislature, and that is the state budget. Oklahomans need to be able to provide feedback. And 
let their officials know how they feel about the priorities expressed in the budget. But unfortunately, again, this year, we saw none of that. And so today, we stand here with our Senate Democratic colleagues in saying that we stand against a budget that was built behind closed doors by just a few people in this building. Because let me be clear, it's not just Democrats who are left out of the process. It's also the vast majority of legislative Republicans. This was a surprise to most legislators in this building. Leader Floyd spoke about the press conference last Thursday, but it's important to note that we didn't actually have a budget at that press conference. We had a few priorities, a few numbers. We did not have a spreadsheet outlining exactly how this money was going to be spent, exactly how the people's money was going to be spent. We only saw that on Monday, uh, and so we got the general appropriations bill. We got dozens of other appropriations, trailer bills to the general appropriations bill. And we're expected to vote on that just a couple hours later. I fail to see how anyone in this building would have been able to digest and decide whether that was good policy, whether it was good for the citizens of Oklahoma. But what you saw was just a whole lot of rubber stamping going on without any critical thinking. And then about 24 hours later, we in the House were expected to vote on that budget on the House floor and send it over to the Senate. Now the product that we get is a product of the lack of transparency. The budget itself expressed some priorities as all budgets do but the priorities expressed in the budget were not for the people of Oklahoma. They were for corporations. They were for businesses. They weren't for Oklahomans who have suffered over the past year from the economic and health effects of the pandemic. This was truly the product of just a few people behind closed doors and you could tell by the priorities expressed in the budget document itself, that this was not something that the public had input. So we're disappointed. We, we, while, while we know that this uh, ship has likely sailed, we stand here today asking the people of Oklahoma to demand better. You deserve better. You deserve to know exactly where your tax dollars are going, who's benefiting, who's losing, you deserve better from your state government and from your elected officials. And that's why we stand here today is to talk directly to the public and ask for their assistance in making this a better process for everyone in Oklahoma. Anything else? We'll take some questions. Uh, Senator Floyd, you mentioned your caucus would be introducing legislation next year to address this. What kind of things do you see your caucus introducing? What I think we're going to do is, and what, what I'm going to recommend, and we've talked about this, is let's look at the process and how we've, how we've seen it work for the last few years because we know, not, know it's not working. And let's tailor some solutions. Let's, let's put out some solutions that are actually going to work. We can sit here and, and argue about non-open and non-transparent, but if we're not going to offer solutions, then it's not going to do us any good. So we're going to do that. One of the things that, that is a, a big problem, and those of you that are up here at the Capitol see this, and you've seen it the last week since the budget, was announced, and that is JCAB meetings and, and other committee meetings where we are sitting in the meeting and we are being handed bills that we are about to be asked to vote on. And this is not an exaggeration. These bills are actually sometimes warm because they just came off the printers. So we are sitting there with 24, 36 bills that we may or may not have seen a few hours before and being asked to, to vote on education budget, roads and bridges, health care, Department of Corrections, that's no way to govern. We cannot make responsible decisions, and more importantly, we can't hear from our constituents in that period of time. So that's one of the things that we need to do. We need to have a public hearing, notice public input. We do it for rulemaking. Every agency in the state has to go through a rulemaking process where they have 30 days to get public comments. The budget's so important. We can find a way to make this work. As you know, you know, 
any member trying to propose an amendment is pretty much you know not existent here. Can you talk a little bit about that process and what you'd like to see moving forward? I'm going to let Emily talk about that. I was in the House for two years before the Senate, and, and the rules move a little slower in the Senate, but in the House side, suspending rules, amendments is just, I'll let, I'll let. <laughs> <laughs> well, there are no rules in the House, <laughs> is, is the long and short of it. Uh, and the way that this budget was crafted and introduced and passed was just par for the course this legislative session. What we've seen all along is that the rules that the Republicans pass they can't even follow themselves. So how is the public supposed to know what's going on in this building if these rules that are supposed to safeguard transparency are just suspended all the time? They're just thrown out the window. Uh, the, the press can't even tell what's going on. How is the public supposed to know what's going on? So with these, with these budget bills, though, there are joint rules that say that they can't be amended. And so that is is just another factor in this what you see is the only product that you're allowed to vote on so the vast majority of members uh, have not had any input in the budgetary process uh, they are then given a budget with less than a day to figure out how they want to vote on it they can't hear from their constituents and they can't propose amendments so it's just a straight up or down vote. And, uh, and, and like I said, this isn't just a Democratic issue. The vast majority of Oklahomans who are represented by Republicans, their legislators also don't have input in this process. Talking to your Republican colleagues who are also being left out of this process, what's their opinion about changing these rules? Well, I, I, think, I think that that we've heard some frustrations. And while... While that, I think, is encouraging, what we've heard all along during this legislative session, whether it's Senate Bill 2 attacking transgender student athletes, whether it's, uh, you know, banning certain conversations from happening in classrooms, we hear legislative Republicans behind closed doors and private conversations expressing how frustrated they are. It's time for them to say those things in public and demand better. So while it's heartening to, to hear from them in that way, um, I, I would ask for them to uh, channel their frustration into actual change. Do you think there's an appetite among Republicans for this? I mean, you guys are the minority, right? <laughs> Last time I checked. <laughs> but not forever. I, I can't speak to that. I mean, we are an urban and a rural state, majority rural. Nobody makes any, uh, has any misconceptions about that. Um, what... What each member has to do, and I want to be fair about this, what each member has to do to represent their district is different. So is there an appetite for it? I don't know. I hope there is. I hope that we would want to treat every citizen of Oklahoma with the same dignity of at least giving them enough notice to review laws that are about to affect their lives and the lives of their children. So I, I, hope, that, I hope that there's a, an appetite developing. I truly do. I'm, I'm curious. Um, both caucuses um, have supported for a long time reinstating reinstating the run refundability of the earned income tax credit um, and, and hasn't come to the Senate yet but it will this afternoon and the House there was some discussion of that in Oklahoma it was going to be five percent versus the federal of seven percent mm -hmm. can you dumb down for me what that means and um, is that I mean are we getting like a short changed version version of a refundable tax credit I'm gonna let Emily answer that and I'm only because they've already had the come yeah. through and they've heard the house debate and they've heard everybody's everybody's position on this so yeah so so the dumbed down version is that the er the earned income tax credit is a program that simply lets low income Oklahomans keep more of their hard earned money and when we talk about 5% versus 7% what that means is that at 5% in Oklahoma our workers are getting to keep less of their money if we increased that to 7% or if we went beyond that, like a lot of other states have done, uh, we're just asking to go to the 7% federal level. If we went to that 7%, those families would see an even bigger benefit. And we know that, especially with families who are living paycheck to paycheck, struggling to pay bills, struggling to, to feed their families, that 
every dollar counts, especially in uh, in this time where a lot of workers are still trying to recover from the economic effects of the pandemic. And when the EITC was um, revoked in Oklahoma, did it match the federal at the time? I believe that it was tied to the federal level, uh, but it no longer is. We've seen a few pieces of legislation that decouple our tax policies from federal tax policies. And so I, I believe that it was decoupled and that it will stay at that 5% level if this bill is signed into law. But, um, you know, the the taking away the refundability was tragic for families and the fact that combined with no longer accepting federal unemployment benefits, this is really going to affect those working families. It seems one of the biggest differences between the budget guys, the budget you all want and what the Republicans is amount of savings. Um, can you talk a little bit about that and what you would like to, instead of putting that into savings, what priorities would you like to be spent on? Yeah, one of the, well, there were there were some pandemic specific related items that we proposed. Uh, so what you've seen in a lot of states is a hazard pay program for those frontline workers that have been truly keeping us uh, truly keeping us safe and alive the last year. And so we wanted to show appreciation from the state, uh, a fifty million dollar program that frontline workers would be able to access. One of the biggest issues that we see in criminal justice reform that's untouched is the fact that we fund uh, those, the, we fund the district attorneys, we fund the district courts, we fund criminal justice on the backs of those who are stuck in the system. And so they, they truly can never get out of the system even though they've been charged with a misdemeanor a few years ago. Uh, they, they are still expected to fund those core services of government. And so that was one of the really exciting parts of our budget proposal and one that could easily be taken care of with uh, the extra savings that Republicans decided to just store away in a piggy bank. One of the other items I heard about was uh, ending the grocery sales tax. Is that something that you guys want to try and still pursue next budget? Absolutely. So uh, we are glad that in proposing that, that a conversation seems to have taken place all across Oklahoma. We've heard from many Oklahomans who say they lived in other states before. When they moved to Oklahoma, they couldn't believe that they were expected to pay a sales tax on groceries. And it's one of the most regressive taxes. So what, what we wanted to do in the budget was uh, really shift our thinking in terms of who's taking care of and who benefits in our revenue and our expenditures. And we wanted to shift that and, and make major changes to the tax code to make sure that those at the bottom weren't being asked to fund a disproportionate share of their government. And so we, we absolutely plan to keep pushing on this and we've seen some bipartisan support for it. Um, so we're excited about the conversation that's been started on that issue. Representative, on that topic, uh, and I've out of read the full proposal. Are you, are you talking specifically the state, state portion, tax, not the local? Municipal? Right. So the the state portion is four and a half percent, and so we would uh, eliminate that. Um, municipalities would still be able to tax at a level that they felt appropriate, but this would be a pretty big deal to cut it by almost five percent for for families who are who are shopping for for bread and groceries every day. Just to clarify, um, this small group of Republicans who crafted this budget, how many are we talking about? Well, at the, at the press conference where they announced it, uh, you had two uh, committee chairs from the House, two from the Senate. Um, and then you have the speaker and the pro tem and the governor. And what I would point out was that apparently there were no women involved in that negotiation process, no people of color. Um, so this was, a, and I think that you can see that in the product that, that we received. I think, that's, I think that's accurate. The other part of the budgetary process that, that we've had a concern about is that even though we have members on the appropriation subcommittees, and, and I think maybe that's when they say, you know, we've participated. They're, they're talking about the subcommittees for appropriations. Well, the budgetary process, as you all know, is a year-round process. And we don't even start the budgetary numbers and crunching the numbers until we get the agency's budgets, which they send us around October. So um, looking at a budget from an agency and determining what their needs are is a lot different than being in the room when you're talking about where we're going to spend the dollars. 
And, and no one to my, I can, I can speak for my caucus, no one has had that kind of input. So when you ask how many people were at the table, the, the appropriations chair, the vice chair, the pro tem at some point, and that's, that's speaker. the speaker. That's about all. I guess my question, just from an overarching point of view on the process, would be I could, I could uh, see Republicans, whether voters or members, saying, well, we have two super majorities. You know, why should we, what's the incentive to include the minority in this process? And I wonder what your response would be to that. I'm not sure if, if they would understand the concept or, or definition of democracy. I mean, I represent 78,000 people. Every, and everyone in my caucus, roughly 78,000 people. Now, granted, we don't have 50% of the state, but why does a person who live in my district, why are they not entitled to the same sort of representation that somebody that lives in another district that has a Republican? It, it's that simple. You know, they deserve representation. That's what they elected us to do. And frankly, it's not the voters' problem. It's the fact that the process up here is not inclusive, transparent, and open to the public. We, we're elected officials. We're used to things changing on a dime. We're used to being in the minority. We know what that's like. But my constituents should not have to suffer through a non-transparent process that ends up affecting them with a budget that's going to affect their everyday, everyday lives. Do you think the legislature should be subject to op the Open Meetings Act like most government agencies are? I'll, I'll take it. Yeah, I mean, we've we've introduced legislation to that effect um, because the the safeguards that are in place for other governmental bodies are just as important, if not more important, in this building. And so when you see committee meetings that don't have an agenda until right before, you have uh, bills on an agenda that don't have any language, um, the way that we fix that is by subjecting the legislature to the Open Meetings Act. And so I think we would be supportive of that. The, the core tenet of the Open Meetings Act is to let the public know what their government is doing. And so we absolutely would, would be supportive of that. Do you support um, requiring that bodies that are subject to the Open Meeting Act post their agendas and meeting notices on their websites? Yeah, I think that was a, I think that's been in legislation this mm -hmm. year, if I'm not mistaken. I never saw it. I didn't know if you talk afterwards. This may be a little in the weeds, but my administrative law background just pops up every once in a while. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's very important that the public have notice that they're going to actually see. And that may be a website, but it also may, you may just have to go ahead and post a paper notice on the front door. In a lot of these smaller towns and rural areas, they are used to either seeing it in the, in the county newspaper or post it on the, on the county courthouse door. So we, we take a lot of pride, and understandably and justifiably, with our strong rural communities. But we've got to tailor these things to the area and the audience you're talking to. You know, we've had, I've had discussions, I know this is in the weeds, but I've had discussions about making public notice available to the, to the audience that you're trying to reach. So if it's a website, that's great. If it's just the old-fashioned way of posting it on a courthouse door, do it. You know, these, these, we've got a lot of big issues. That's not a problem. That's not a big issue. It's an easy fix. Currently, the law Absolutely. allows for currently the law allows for anybody, not human body, any public body, to only post a paper copy in a window of a building somewhere. And so, there is no requirement for say a university or a public school or the State Department of Transportation or any of those bodies to actually post that online. Many do, but then there are other instances where many don't. Some entities don't have websites. And so I was just wondering in a digital world whether there's been discussion. I've asked this of Greg Treat like five times. So, you know, take it personally, but I just, it's flabbergasting to me that in 2021, we're still, the only requirement is that you put it in a window on the back of a building. This honestly changes every year. It's every other year or so we see another, another brilliant idea on how to fix public notice. And sometimes it's everybody's got broadband, which they don't. Everybody's got access, which they don't. So we just can do it online. And then the other side of it is we need to just do it the old-fashioned way in the newspapers and the courthouse. Why don't we just do both? Problem solved. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.